возлюбленной Богом Церковь, начиная наше богослужение пред Господом, встанем, пожалуйста, и утвердим обетование, относящееся к преддверию нашей надежды. Да воцарится воскресение Христова в наших телах. Склоним наши головы в молитве. Дорогой Небесный Отец, во имя Иисуса Христа, мы благодарны имени Твоему Святому за столь великую привилегию быть на месте всем, которое очертила десница Твоя для поклонения Святому имени Твоему. И ныне позволь наследию Твоему во имя крови завета подняться на вершины для нас недосягаемые и сокрушить всякое бремя и запинающий нас грех. Да будут прокляты в этом служении, как и прежде, все дела дьявола, болезни, нищета, преждевременная смерть, демоническая зависимость, всевозможные страхи, депрессии, разрушение, костность, невежество, все это да отступит от шатров святого народа Твоего. И ныне встань, Господи, на место покоя Твоего Ты и ковчег могущества Твоего, и да облекутся святые Твои спасением Твоим, и да возрадуются пред лицом Твоим. Дай нам больше от Духа Твоего, пропитай нас Духом Твоим святым, позволь нам найти светлое лицо Твое. Я представляю это служение в Твои божественные руки, веди его рукою превознесенную, великий Бог, Отец, Сын, Дух Святой. Аминь. Да благословит вас Господь, можете садиться.
жизни самое прекрасное. Не ценую денег погубается, Даром светит солнце ясное. Нам в подарок Бога преподнесено Иисусе вечное спасение Принимай и улыбайся весело Чтобы все счастливее Прощение. Посмотри, как Бог тебе склоняется, И пойми, что так свет солнце ясного Не ценою денег покупается, В нашей жизни самое прекрасное. Жизни самое прекрасное, Не ценою денег покупается, Даром светит солнце ясное, И луна нам даром улыбается. Что же вы стоите в отдале?
света, а грязный мирской в свете.
And so before we continue to study the inheritance that we have in Jesus Christ that is contained in the written Word of God, the unchanging epigraph of the study of the Word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And for us as partakers of the body of Christ, to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so we can put on the new way or form of life. Ephesians 4, 22-24 that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to god in true righteousness and holiness <clears throat> and to fulfill this command we as we already know need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs and this is put off be renewed and put on We've noted that your decision regarding these three destiny-impacting questions will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or vessel of wrath, or more specifically, will the completion of our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it and our names be forever blotted out of the book of life? In a specific format, we have already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the, the last question, what conditions are to be fulfilled so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we begin the process of dressing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God, in Christ Jesus, in righteousness and holy truth. We've talked about this, that this place of Scripture was a revelation for the last days because the church, the apostolic church in the first days was not in these, within these parameters, although God, by the apostles, revealed these parameters to be able to be dressed into the new person was not something that was happening because the first church, not regardless of the teaching of the apostles, still continued to uh, look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the practicing of them. <clears throat> and Apostle Paul needed to continuously say to them, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual people, but as people that are still children in Christ. And talking about the fact that a person of the flesh does not receive things of the Spirit because he receives them as, or sees them as foolishness. He he revealed uh, such great levels that they considered them to be foolish. This was the promise for the last days. The bride of the Lamb needs to be dressed into the new person just as before the exiting out of Egypt, the nation of Israel was completely healed, renewed, and were free. They were, lib uh, they were liberated. Something happened to them in that night, as we talked about before. They all received healing. 
But such healing, it wasn't just healing of sickness. There were many people crippled. People didn't have legs or ears or noses because at the time there were such punishment that they would uh, t remove your limbs or uh, <coughs> other parts of your body for any kind of action that they weren't pleased with. And all were healthy and strong. And before the Lord raises his church, he needs to glorify her. She needs to be dressed. This body, this mortal body, needs to be dressed into the new person. This means that people need to be healed then from all their sicknesses, miraculous healing, those that don't have some kind of organs, those organs will be, organs will be restored, those who have uh, specific uh, other assisting equipment in their body to help them live, uh, hair will be uh, grow again and other things well ev everything will be renewed and a person will become younger again and this element of aging will stop and this will shock the world the religious world because the religious world is always uh, the most part or the multitude will be the, the the religious world the chosen are the small flock and why because they offer the demands of holiness and, of course, this promises for the people of the last days. And in regards to clothing ourselves into our new person, we've concluded that we need God's help, that is, we need His mercy, because the mercy of God is the great and unique power of God, identifying the essence of God, as well as the imperishable inheritance of peace, prepared by Him for man, born from the seed of the word of truth and perfection one who is performing his uh, God's righteousness. The means of receiving any kind of help from God, which we see as the inheritance of the mercies of God, is weaponry of prayer or worship. Since prayer isn't just a man's means of communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God, man gives heaven this right so that heaven may intervene upon the earth. And we can possess the right that activates the given law of God only upon his established conditions. In our dedication to God, our inner state is the same as the inner state or inner essence of God. One of the prayers of David written in the 143rd Psalm, accurately, there's a lot of other uh, psalms as well, but we've been studying this one, accurately reveal the conditions upon which a man is called to give God the right to interject his mercy into a person's life. <clears throat> and this has been the component of our continuing study. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications, in your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul, he has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. <clears throat> Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Your mercy cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant.
Therefore, to be heard by God, David needed to present to God a basis, cause, or a particular right that would be able to serve as sufficient evidence before God so that God can intervene into David's life with his faithfulness and his righteousness. And such evidence in this prayer, as we already know, were ten arguments that David presented to God saying, Hear me, that we also need to present to God. Hear me in your faithfulness and in your righteousness. Hear me because I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. Hear me because I spread out my hands to you. Hear me for in you do I trust. Hear me because I lift up my soul to you in the moment of crisis, in the moment of loss. I don't run to psychologists. I run to you. I trust in you. When all means are gone, when there's an economical crisis around, I hope and I trust, not upon economical programs or government programs, but you. Hear me, because in you I take shelter, I lift up my soul to you. To lift up my soul to you means to nail it to the cross upon the altar hear me for you are my god hear me i have no other gods but you hear me for your namesake hear me for your righteousness sake and hear me for i am your servant the greatest position before God, a willing and conscious decision to be obedient to the will of God <clears throat> that is well understood by being instructed in faith by those delegated people whom God trusted with his word. In the previous services, we had already studied the nature of the first argument. This was evidence that David abided in faithfulness and righteousness, that gave God the lawful right to stand on the side of David in his oppositions against his enemies, and stopped to study the second argument. The second argument is evidence written upon the tablets of the heart of David that he presented in prayer in the memories of the days of old and all the deeds that God had done in those days. This form of evidence is the breastplate of judgment of the high priest, which is a continual remembrance or a continual memorial before God, containing the component of continual prayer. The breastplate of judgment was created for one purpose, and this purpose was the urim and the thummim in the heart of a man. The existence of these two allowed God to hear man and man to hear God. Therefore, to be heard by God in the revelation of his Urim, it is necessary to keep within your mind the works of God, that is, his Thummim, that God had done in the days of old. Answering the second question, what purpose has the breastplate of judgment as a component of continual remembrance within the relationship of a redeemed person and God himself? We came to the conclusion that the breastplate of judgment as an item of continual remembrance before God is a sacral symbol of the format of continual prayer. Therefore, prayer that is not in accordance to the requirements and characteristics characteristics of the breastplate of judgment does not have the right to be called prayer because only the format of continuous prayer presented in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest gives us the right to come before God and to enter the holy place as kings and priests of God not possessing the virtues of a king and a priest we will not be able to present the interests of the judgments of God in accordance to those commandments and statutes that identify the union of teachings of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh contained in the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment and the twelve names of the sons of Jacob written upon these stones. Apostle Paul, speaking of the breastplate of judgment, which is a component of continual remembrance and continual prayer, said, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, Colossians 4.2. This is talking about the breastplate of judgment. This is the only component that is a continual remembrance before God. Other items are a remembrance for God. It, it, they only come, though, at specific times and are not a continual item of of, re of remembrance for God. Continuing earnestly in prayer identifies a joyously burning lamp, identifying the condition of the righteous heart of a man. 
Proverbs 13, 9, the light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. A person dies for God when his lamp dies and th then turns from a holy person into an unclean person. The built order of the a breastplate of judgment identifies the demands of spirit and truth that the true worshipers of God whom God seeks need to be in accordance to and need to possess. God is still not at peace. He's still looking for people who would be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. Breaking or interfering the order of building the breastplate of judgment, identifying the state and nature of a worshiper of God, the breastplate of judgment loses its nature and its purpose. John 4, 23, 24. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. We know that worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth includes not peddling with the truth when pursuing the goals that God has placed in Scripture, as people have done in all times and many do today, because of their stiff neck and for the benefit of their greed and their hypocrisy. In the Septuagint, Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the breastplate of judgment is called the sign of justice. As by the means of the Urim and the Thummim that is contained in the breastplate of judgment, God reveals to man his judgments. I do not know by what right the theologians thought or by or uh, where they got it from that these were two stones and two pieces of material. The breastplate of judgment was uh, on the chest and the, and the arm and the thumb were hidden in there uh, and both of course applied to the word of God because uh, Thummim is the word of God and Urim is the revelation of the Holy Spirit explaining the Thummim then they couldn't just have been two stones These needed to, this needed to be so either gold because the word of God is the pure gold and the Holy Spirit cannot pre be presented as something diff different. This is also gold, two formats of wisdom, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and so it couldn't have been in just two pieces of material and two stones. God intentionally hid this from us, and it's not explained anywhere. And if it's not explained, let us not try to make up what it might be. Let us look at the definition or the meaning of the Urm and the Thummim. The symbol of the breastplate of judgment is identified as the conscience of a man purified from dead works, upon the tablets of whom, just as a sign that the teaching of Jesus Christ is imprinted, that came in the flesh. Therefore, the conscience that is purified of dead works with the imprinted faithfulness and righteousness upon its tablets is called to identify the nature of a true worshiper of God, that upon the foundation of faithfulness and righteousness would be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. And this will give then God the right to function in them and through them upon planet Earth. <clears throat> in a specific format, we have already studied the measurements and the nature of materials from which the breastplate of judgment is supposed to be built, that we need to be in accordance to within our spirit, and stop to study the next requirement which states, Exodus 28, 17 through 21, and you shall put settings of stone in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be Sirius, topaz, and emerald. The second is turquoise, sapphire, and diamond. Third row, jacinth, agate, and amethyst. And fourth, beryl, onyx, and jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stone shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engraving of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the twelve tribes. We note that the 12 golden filigree settings of the breastplate of judgment is the living, undamaged, and presented in its original form, the truth, imprinted and abiding upon the tablets of our heart, identifying the word of God that once came out of the mouth of God. This is the word of God, this is the truth. <clears throat> Therefore, the 12 golden settings identified the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, that we as worshipers of God are called to present in our continual prayer. The twelve precious stones with the engraved upon them as a sign at names of the sons of Israel is a symbol and format of our continual prayer presenting the perfect judgment of God. 
From this we can see that it wasn't the golden settings, being the truth of the Word of God, that were adjusted in measurement and configuration to the precious stones, but the precious stones were the ones which are our prayers that were adjusted and configured to fit the golden settings of truth. In other words, our prayers need to be adjusted to the Word of God, be in accordance to the will of God. Only when we ask what is in accordance to His will will we receive continual prayer in the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment with the twelve names is a persisting prayer that in its intercession presents the interests of the will of God and does not sway away or step away from the goal until what is asked is received. The building of the breastplate of judgment contains not just measurements and nature of materials, but also method and means that are called to identify the nature of a continual prayer necessary for reaching the goals that God has placed for us to build the kingdom of heaven within our heart, which is also identified as the tree of life. Growing the tree of life within your heart is building yourself up into a new person created in accordance to God in righteousness and holy truth, into a spiritual house and a holy priesthood. With this we will remember that all of the beauty and order of the temple was built for one holy item and for the service of one holy item. This was the golden ark of the covenant. All of the beauty, all of the components of the temple were created for this one thing, the Golden Ark of the Covenant, because it is where God was. The same thing with the ephod of the high priest, with the connected to it breastplate of judgment. It was created for and served only one holy item. This item very accurately was called to du duplicate and fulfill the function of the Golden Ark. This was the Urim and the Thummim. Because the Golden Ark of the Covenant, as well as the breastplate of judgment, symbolize from different angles and with various purposes the co conscience of a man cleansed from dead works. When Jesus explained to the Samaritan woman, where, the Samaritan woman asked, where do I pray? She, she said, you say that we need to pray in your temple, but our fathers worship here on Mount Gerizim because the Jews did not allow the Samaritans to go and worship in their temple. They circumcised themselves and they received the God of Israel. So they made something similar upon their own mountain and worshiped there. And the Samaritan woman asks, a Jew... A, ra a rabbi, she doesn't see the Messiah in him yet. She asked, or he asked her for a drink, and she, being surprised at that, she said, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? A Samaritan. Jews do not communicate with Samaritans. We don't want to communicate with you. Uh, it's not that we don't want to communicate with you as if the Samaritans, but the Jews didn't. But Jesus says, if you would have known what God gives and who it is, who is asking you then you yourself would ask uh, and he, she changes the way she speaks with him and says you are, I see you are a prophet sir uh, tell me where to pray this woman wanted to understand and he reveals to her a mystery and here's what he said to her not upon this mountain and not in Jerusalem but in spirit and in truth anywhere. And so here we see that Urim and the Thummim, these were the components, this component the, that was in the breastplate of, judge, of judgment, it was on the chest of the high priest. And David wore this wherever he went, he t wherever he wanted to put it on. This was an element of continual prayer in spirit and in truth. He didn't need to, when he needed to worship God or ask God for something uh, uh, before a battle or he would be somewhere deep in the mountain, somewhere in the fields, he said, bring me the ephod and he would ask God, Lord, will you give me a victory here? Will you be able to be with us? here or should I go or not go or and so people ask what was in the temple the temple had the golden ark what did the high priest do the thing is David was the high priest in that moment there was a high priest but David was the main high priest of the time <clears throat> he was the high priest in accordance to Melchizedek and not Levi and no one allowed he did not have he did not become leprous he entered into the holy place he put on the ephod 
And he said, as I saw you in the temple, he saw the Lord. He, he saw him, he understood. Not a single king was able to enter that place. We know when Ozia tried to or dared to enter into the temple, into the holy place, he, was, he became leprous, if you remember, but David was able to. And Jesus came as a descendant uh, from David. And so he, not being from the uh, line of Levi, was able to wear this. So the Urim and the Thummim in Hebrew means light and perfection, light and the right or revelation and truth. For example, the Ten Commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant is the truth, and the truth upon the breastplate of judgment is the Thummim. The revelation that a person could receive at the mercy seat or the lid of the Ark is the Urim and the breastplate of judgment. Therefore, only a person who has a conscience cleansed from dead works or a wise heart upon which the truth in the form of the Thummim is imprinted can be a worshiper of God. The revelation of God, also known as his Urim, can function only within the boundaries of truth. This truth within the heart of a person is the Thummim. The teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, as it is written, I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that I may make all that I have commanded you. Exodus 31.6 Practically, it's talking about the quality and friendship of two formats of wisdom that are contained in the Thummim and the Urim, and about the fact that the carriers of the Urim and the Thummim are true worshippers of God and possess the immune system of, the most important is they possess the immune system of the Holy Spirit. Carriers of the Urim and the Thummim have the immune system of the Holy Spirit and you cannot curse them. If you curse them, that means you will be sent to hell. To confront them, to resist them is dangerous too. Levi, one who is binded to God, led by the Spirit of God, people who are led by the Spirit of God have the name of Levi. They have binded themselves in accordance to the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh and understand the voice of the Holy Spirit in God's delegated people. And of Levi, he said, Let your thummim and your urim be with your Holy One whom you tested at Massa. This is Deuteronomy 33, 8 through 11. And with whom you have contended at the waters of Meribah, who says of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children. This is the category of people who died for their nation, their house, and for their personal desires. For they, for they are, for they have observed your word and kept your covenant. These are Levites. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They, put, they shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the works of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him, that they rise not again. With this we note that the future of men that say of themselves that they belong to the chosen by God nation, that they're saved and righteous, however hate and confront the carriers of the Thummim and the Urim, hate them because they themselves do not have these Thummim and Urim, their future is the lake of fire burning with fire and brimstone. In a specific format, we have already looked at the first five qualities of a warrior in prayer in the first five precious stones of the breastplate of judgment by which God can continuously reveal His will upon planet Earth and stop to study the sixth quality and precious stone which we see as the diamond stone. We know that the sixth name carved upon the precious stone of the breastplate of judgment upon the tablets of our heart is the name of the sixth son of Jacob, Naphtali, which means wrestler. Genesis 37, 8, And Rachel's maid Bila conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With the great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali one who overcomes in prayer or is a wrestler. We note that the diamond is a brilliant stone, it's a pure carbon, and so that is why it contains hardness and resistance. The word brilliant doesn't apply to any other stone except for the brilliant shine and polish of a diamond. According to the Jewish rabbinate, the name of God, we see every stone, 
spoke or uh, identified some kind of name of God. According to the Jewish rabbinate, the name of God we see revealed in the precious diamond stone in Hebrew is El Hai, which when translated means God is alive. Therefore, based on the definition of the name Naphtali upon the precious diamond stone, we can conclude that the function of the sixth principle identifying the nature of continual prayer with which we need to be a continual memorial before God is our ability to allow the Holy Spirit to abide with us in our prayer battles against the powers of hell which confront us when we fulfill the will of God by the name of the living God. Jeremiah 10.10, But the Lord is the true God, He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure His indignation. The name of the living God is a format of an oath for the Israelite nation and the category of the nation that had not learned to swear by the living God. This doesn't mean the Lord lives before whom I stand. You need to have the right to say this, to learn about it and those who did not learn and or they swore falsely because they did not learn were completely destroyed Jeremiah 12 16 17 and it shall be if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives as they taught my people to swear by Baal that they then they shall be established in the midst of my people but if they do not obey I will, uh, will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation says the Lord therefore to not be eradicated and eliminated by the wrath of the living God it is necessary to learn the ways of the nation of God to swear by the name of God El Hai or by the living God and these these ways are the paths of the commandments and statutes of God. The condition that gives us the right to learn the ways or paths of God's commandments and statutes to swear by the name of the living God is the thirst to know Him. This is the condition, the thirst to know them. Psalm 119, 32 through 35. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk the paths of your commandments, for I delight in it. Delighted in them, that's desired them, thirst for them. The term living when it comes to God is one who is abiding, one who is with unconditional authority, one who defines a genesis, creates the genesis, holds the genesis, keeps the genesis, rules over the genesis, and is commander and lord of the genesis. Deuteronomy 10, 20 and 21. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oath in his name. He is your praise and he is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. The result of swearing by the name of the living God was always the fulfillment of the promise of God for the sake of which the oath was made. The power of a warrior in prayer contained within the quality of the name of the living God is called to present the unlimited power of God over Genesis in the allotted by him for us time and boundaries. Therefore, it is necessary first to determine what goal God has in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer. And in what way and upon what conditions is God able and desires to give, give man the right to become a warrior in prayer, so that man may present the interests of God and implement or actualize his inheritance in God. Per the definitions provided in Scripture, to be a warrior in prayer is the lawful and privileged inheritance of holy men of all times. This is their primary or first most purpose that is revealed in their calling, to perform righteousness, to be able to trample upon uncleanness and and the unclean in their prayer battles. This is one of the greatest positions that is gifted by God to man, in which a person becomes a king and a priest to God, and is seen by God as a brilliant stone or the diamond stone with the name of Naphtali. Not being a king and a priest to God in the virtues of which a person receives the right to reign with his informational organ over his emotional organ, it is impossible to be a warrior in prayer. <clears throat> if a person is not able to reign with his informational pro organ over his emotions 
he cannot be a person of prayer. Many people are led by their feelings and not by knowledge. Faith is not from feelings. Faith is from information. It is the information that we receive and accept. And we need to be led by the word of God, not what we see or what we feel. <clears throat> Whatever may happen to us, we don't need to be distracted. We need to look. Are we behaving in accordance to the word of God? May the world, even the whole religious world, confront us or even crucify us or stone us. If it is what we need to, how we need to die, we'll die as heroes. <clears throat> The prayer of a warrior in prayer is a sacral or holy mystery that has an unearthly genesis, therefore is inaccessible to the comprehension of the human mind or with human abilities. We more than once note that by its nature the genesis of prayer is the, is the genesis of God, therefore the genesis of prayer as well as the genesis of God does not have a beginning and does not have an end. Prayer is the language of God, identifying the essence of God. The language as a language of a person identify his nationality, who he is, the language of God identify the essence of God, and identifying the word of God that identifies the genesis of God himself. Prayer has always been the mystery of God, as it has always existed in his presence, as his golden scepter of favor, that he stretched forth to the one that would seek his face in performing his will. If, however, anyone dared to come to him upon his own conditions, not being called into his presence, then God's golden scepter of favor is, was not stretched out to one asking, and resulted in this person's prayer being unheard by God. As it is written, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does, he does, and does God's will, he hears him. John 9.31 And people ask him, how does God love the sinner? Where, show me where, where God says that he loves sinners. God hates the sin but loves the sinner. God hates the sin and the sinner and does not listen to the sinner. He loves only those that hate sin and are in, in slavery, people who are in slavery to sin. <clears throat> they are not sinners, they are slaves. A sinner is one that legalizes sin and willingly does it happily and says this is not a sin, this is a sinner. But one that falls and rises and falls and rises is not a sinner. This is a righteous one because he calls sin as it is, it's sin and strives to do truth and a righteous will fall seven times but rise again. He falls but he's not a sinner, why? because he hates sin. He is a slave of sin. And that is why God came to deliver the slave of sin. But people who call sin as truth, as good, he hates them. Because the right to come close to and stand before God in prayer, God is an initiator of prayer in the situation that a warrior in prayer, in the virtue of his worshiper, begins to pray with the language of God, identifying the precious essence of God in his unchanging will. Again, the right to be close or stand before God is the exclusive prerogative of God. No one will be able to or will dare by himself to come close or approach God, the God that desires to abide in darkness or in mystery or in the unapproachable unapproachable light. Sometimes people say, I enter into the temple, I come close to God. They may say this, but they don't know what the temple is or to come to or what it means to come close to God, if you come into the presence of God, you will begin to tremble. You will not be able to dance or shout or turn in any way. You're going to be in great reverence and fear, and you will listen to what he will tell you. Look at what happened when the priest would enter into the temple. <clears throat> how, how how they entered with fear, how they prepared themselves. Thirty years they learned the law, how to enter, and when they entered in accordance to that law, very accurately, he would remove his garments, he would wash himself, he would offer sacrifices, he washed himself in the bronze sea so that there not be any sweat on him, and in this way he entered. Yeah, David also wearing the... David 
the breastplate of judgment. He did dance outside of the temple, but he never danced inside the temple. And so all of those dancers today that shout and dance and thinking and teaching that this is the gift of the Holy Spirit, this is an expression of the unclean spirit that presents itself as the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah 30, 21, 22. There your nobles shall be from among them, and their governor shall come from their midst. Then I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledged his heart to approach me? Says the Lord, you shall be my people, and I will be your God. God chooses one person from the seed of Abraham that he has brought close to himself and by him he will make his nation the people his nation and will be their God. In accordance to the prophetic revelation we can see that approaching or entering God's presence is the task of one governor that will come from the nation seed of Abraham. And this is the only Son of God in the status of a Son of Man, in whom and by whom anyone born from God and seeking God would be able to approach and enter God's presence. We are not able to just come to God. We can come to God in Jesus and and in Jesus, by Jesus and in Jesus. That is why from all the existing forms of service, continual prayer, giving a person the right to run to God is the most difficult to access form of service that most Christianity for the most part avoids, forsakes, and refuses to their own destructions. 1 Timothy 1.18 This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. <clears throat> and to define and build a clear and orderly for a system that will teach us and help us get to know the language of God and the signs contained in the nature of continual prayer, identifying the state of a warrior in prayer that would be able to be founded on specific commandments of God, giving man the lawful right to swear by the name of the living God. Based upon the revelations written in Scripture, our prayer in the quality of a warrior in prayer identified by the virtues of the diamond needs to be continual, persistent, diligent, with boldness, with reverence, with revealing or expressing of the faith of the heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, in the Holy Spirit, or praying in tongues. Further, we note that each of the ten listed righteous qualities are present in each other, come one from the other, strengthen one the other, complete one the other, and identify the truthfulness of one the other. In other words, each of the ten listed qualities are existing in balance and are present in each of the other nine. Therefore, the truthfulness of each of the qualities is determined by the presence of the other qualities that together united make up a wonderful balance in perfect in knowledge. Nevertheless, each of the ten qualities has its own face, its unrepeated and inherent only to it taste, color, odor, and character of behavior, and thus has its own exclusive and specific application and its own specific purpose. In a specific or particular format, we have already looked at the signs of the first five qualities included in prayer as well as the state of a warrior in prayer, identifying the atmosphere of his heart, and stop to study the sixth quality within the nature of a warrior in prayer, and this is faith. We note that in Scripture, the character and virtue that is included in the word faith is prescribed in prayer as a commandment, as a prescription without deviations, and as an urgent military command. If this command that is to be fulfilled without deviations is not fulfilled when we confront the organized powers of hell, this is described per Scripture as a final break or disruption of your relationship with God, which also equals vengeance of the second death, because everything we do out of faith is actually a resistance against God. Faith as a virtue and atmosphere of the born spirit also takes part in the state of the, of the heart of the one who prays, that is called to be present in all that a person does with diligence and from the soul. Continual prayer is a demonstration of faith and has an unearthly genesis. Although it is done within the boundaries of time and captures all of time, it is out of the boundaries of time and supersedes time. To better understand the meaning or significance of the element of faith, we select 
constructed as a foundation for our learning four aspects so that we may determine the essence that is contained in the quality and character of faith and to see the unconditional requirements of its presence. Defining the essence and purpose of faith, the price for obtaining faith, keeping and developing faith, the fruits and rewards in the fruit of faith. But first I will once again list the antonyms or opposite qualities of prayer that we we have uh that we have been studying because having the background of the, of the antonyms of each quality will we will better and more clearly understand the character of the real qualities of prayer the antonym of continual is unfaithful or one not continuing the antonym of persistent is resistant the antonym of diligent is lazy the antonym of boldness is audacity the antonym of reverence is forsaking or hating the antonym of the faith of God is unbelief and being resistant to the faith of God Psalm 50 16 17 but to the wicked God says what right right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth sometimes people say what is not in their heart they confess what is written in the Word of God but is not within his heart and so the sixth sign of a warrior in prayer identifying within the breastplate of judgment the precious diamond with the name of Naphtali is faith of a warrior in prayer that comes from and based is based or founded on listening to the word of God that comes out of the mouth of God by his delegated leaders that are dressed into the power of the Holy Spirit to be the lips or mouth of God. Second Chronicles 36, 15, 16. And there are a lot of places like this. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place but they mocked the messengers of God despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against him and against these people till there was no remedy they told them who are you what do you present why why you are your you're the only one that God speaks to are there not others like you not just to not so they not have to then accept somehow uh, behave as though they don't need to accept God's delegated people and so they blame the, the God's uh, delegated people saying that as if he thinks he is the only one and they uh, say uh, they say these things uh, as if this prophet thinks these things although he does not but they hate him and they themselves want to be their own God they want to interpret everything with their own mind and their mind is their own apostle that that is how they think that's how they they have their own Bible they have their own head <clears throat> Defining the essence and meaning that is included in the word faith, as in the rest of the qualities of prayer, is directly dependent on the quality of our obedience to the will of God. An absence of faith in your continual prayer is valued in accordance to Scripture as a stiff neck, disobedience and defiance of the will of God that is identified as certain resistance against God. Therefore, first question, what is the essence and purpose of faith in the prayer life of a warrior in prayer? We brought forth one of the places spoken by the Son of Man that has gained the status of the chief cornerstone in building of our faith. Mark 11:23. Having the faith of God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed to be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done he will have whatever he says receiving the faith of God into your heart in the seat of the preached word of the truth the faith of God becomes our faith just like as the staff of Moses that he cast to the ground by the command of God the staff became a serpent and afterwards by the command of God after Moses took it by the tail it became a staff again and now is called the staff of God and not Moses Further looking at his at this command, we note that we can and are called to remove by faith and cast into the sea of, obl of oblivion only those mountains that are in our way of fulfilling the will of God, and that stands specifically within the boundaries of our personal responsibility. The key phrase of, in this place of scripture, in the commanding form of the phrase have, in regards to the faith of God, there's a specific rarity, wide semantics, and and practically is taken from the format of a military lexicon. Therefore, sounds not as an offer, not as advice, 
or an alternative to something, but as a military command, as a command of a beginner and perfecter of the faith of God. So the command to have the faith of God is on a level of unearthly command that, that when not obeyed, you will not be able to please God. Therefore, these commands need to be received by us in extreme or critical ne- as an extreme or critical necessity. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Therefore, the need to trust God in his words and to seek God in his word, as well as in your spirit, by itself is already the collaboration of our faith with the faith of God. We know that there is God's faith and, and, and our own faith. Don't confuse these two. And from the other side is pleasing God it's significant that the commanding phrase have the faith of God in Hebrew means have among you a list of the characteristics of the faith of God rewrite the scroll of perspectives of the faith of God upon your heart always attend to the meaning of the faith of God reason about her consistency or what it contains focus your attention upon her speak or describe your benefits or her advantages reveal her in your works and deeds be vigilant and stand guard of her interests keep her as the apple of your eye love her essence submit yourself to her commands tremble before her greatness revere in her presence be bold with her in your prayers Govern with her upon the rights of a possession or property. Possess her in her wholeness. Pay the price of learning to know her. Spend the time to possess her. Practice her in all aspects of your life. Develop her impact upon all aspects of your life. Eat her or consume her as the bread of life and drink her as the water of life. Express patience when waiting for her revelations. Make the personal decision to walk in her paths or her ways. Prepare yourself to fulfill her command without deviation. Strive to go forward to her honors and her calling. Spend the energy to possess her as your personal inheritance. Be bold for her right to be the ruler of your life and never turn your back to her commandments. This is what it means to have the faith of God. Considering such a multifunctional, multipurpose, and diverse, diverse list of active specifications of having the faith of God, we need to again and again first always remember or renew in our mind the knowledge you have about faith so that you, you could prompt, prompt your clear thinking and hold or keep it in a state of continual activeness. Second, anchor, deepen, widen, and utilize this knowledge in your walk in the faith of God. For this reason, in a specific format, we have already studied the first two questions and stopped to study the third question. The third question is what conditions are we required to fulfill to keep and increase faith in ourselves with which we are called to enter the tabernacle because in accordance to the revelations of scripture all that does not increase will decrease and will lose its power we are needing to present seven components explaining the conditions of keeping and increasing our faith although there are many more of them I trust that seven will be enough first component in keeping and increasing our faith in the faith of God will depend on the presence of the faith of God in our heart in the format of a mustard seed have the faith of God as a mustard seed here it's talking about the kingdom of heaven the seed of the kingdom of heaven we've talked about this before I'm just uh, reminding us of this second component in keeping and increasing our faith in the faith of God will depend on the factor of how we work and take care of our garden of Eden or the soil of our heart from deceiving rebellious thoughts perverting or corrupting the teaching of Christ to benefit the flesh third component in keeping and increasing our faith in the faith of God provides for us leaving and rejecting our previous hope for the means of serving our existence fourth component in keeping and increasing our faith in the faith of God is the command to circumcise your heart and your ears Acts 7 51 through 53 <clears throat> you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did so do you which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute and they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the d- direction of angels and have not kept it 
<clears throat> Acts 7, 51 through 53. These are the last words of Stephen before he was stoned. To circumcise your heart and your ears means to attend with your heart to the preached word of the delegated from God and incline your ear to the words of God that come from their mouth. The contemplation of Asaph, Psalm 78, 1 through 11, a revelation that Asaph received from God, and he presented it in a form of a song, <coughs> unaccompanied by musical instruments. Give ear, O my people, in my, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter dark sayings of old. <coughs> when I begin to explain and teach you, I will be uttering things of parables or things of old. And people hate this. They hate when you begin to bring uh, things in parables. They say, say it directly. But the language of God are parables, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to to come the pra to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may rise, arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope on God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright, and those whose spirit was not faithful to God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. <clears throat> Psalm 78, 1 through 11. And so we see here, in order to circumcise your heart <clears throat> and your ears, it is necessary to attend to the law of God and the people who interpret it. Not every person has the lawful right to interpret the law. These are people whom God has sent so that they be leaders of his people. <clears throat> and so when a member of a church sits and says he has his own head in his own Bible, and that is why he does not agree with the person that God has placed to tend his people, then this talks about the fact that this person has stepped away from the truth and that <clears throat> uh, hell is opening for this person. The fifth component in keeping and increasing our faith in the faith of God calls for not walking after idols, the idols our fathers followed. We need to consider that an idol is all that on your list of priorities stands above or higher than seeking and knowing God. This could be gifts of the Holy Spirit, anointing, blessings of all kinds is not important. Anything that we place in our list of priorities above seeking and knowing God is an idol because we begin to worship the gifts and blessing and anointing. We begin to worship these things. We seek them. But God forbid us from doing this. The anointing gifts of the Holy Spirit and blessings. He said, seek the anointer, seek the blesser, seek the giver. If you find the giver, <coughs> because gifts are still going to be in his possession, don't think that practicing gifts of the Holy Spirit, you will become the distributor of gifts. There are specific groups and churches where they teach how to practice gifts of the Holy Spirit, and this is absurd. This is absurd. Because <coughs> the Holy Spirit, it is written, the Holy Spirit is the distributor of gifts and gives it to whom he pleases. And so to learn, it's not possible to learn this. You need to be a student and seek the giver. If you want the gifts of the Spirit to work within your life, seek the giver. If you want anointing to work in your life, seek the anointer. If you want blessing, seek the blesser. That is it. But to seek him, you can seek him in the word of God. And the word of God is given to specific people that can interpret it. Not all can just simply interpret it. The apostle said directly, all the promises of, of him are yes and amen to the glory of, of God through us. 
He said this to his apostles, I send you who you forgive sins, they will be forgiven. Whom you retain, if sins are retained, they will be retained. And so you can come and ask God for forgiveness and confess before your sins before him and think that that's it. This is not true. Jesus said the apostles will forgive or retain sins. These are God's delegated people who I send, who I've placed will do this, not those that you've elected by vote or that you've chosen, but whom I have chosen, who will have my words. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah, and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. The lies led them astray, lies which their fathers followed. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for they pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man on his father go in to the same girl to defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes and taken in pledges and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But you have the Naz- but you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. Nazarite is the root out of dry ground. You say, well, there's nothing specific about this. You just can dr- should drink in, in measure. You can drink in measure. You can uh, commit other sins. You can in measure lie, in measure hate. And what, where will we end up? Because um, in measure to drink and in measure to lie or to measure to worship other idols, it's all the same result. If you say you're not a drunkard because you drink a little, then a fornicator can say, I could just commit, I just once in a while have another partner. And so, as Joyce Meyer says, I drink glasses of wine every day. And she has a lot of followers. She does not have any authority. She does not have a church. There's no pastor over her. They just place each other, but they don't obey each other. This is a business of its own kind, where the unclean spirit works under under the name of an angel of light, but it's not so. They don't teach how to be obedient to the delegated of, of God, how to be a living a member of the body or any of that. That's why it says, but you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, do not prophesy. Because that's what they say. As a pastor of a church told me, about a little more than 10 years, they say, it's good for you. You have anointing, you have the power of God upon you. When, you, when I hear what you say, I pass it to my people, but I, I did uh, sign a document saying uh, to the people that uh, drinking is a sin, but I have no right to say it because the council that I has pleased me, they, they told me I can't say these things. They, they need to tell them that this is joy, this is gladness, we will be saved, we will be raised, we will all be there and so when our service was together their pastor preaches only for like 10-15 minutes and then they have announcements and songs and that's it and even during this time people go out to smoke and look at the do- puppies and the, 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 their mem- my other members' cars. And so the 15 minutes that was given to me, I said a little bit about rapture, that the chosen will be raptured and the saved, not all, only some. He freaked out and he said, he read the place, there'll be thousands and ten thousands, don't worry. But after the church, as soon as we... People started approaching me and and shaking my hand. They said, Pastor, you're right. That's what's written here, but they don't preach this. We ourselves need to find this truth, and we heard this from you. They don't preach these things. They don't explain these things. 
sixth component in keeping and increasing our faith in the faith of God is a person's love to revere in prayer. Nehemiah 1 5 3 11 and I say I pray O Lord God of heaven O great and awesome God you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel your servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against you both my father's house and I have sinned we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments the statutes nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses remember remember I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying if you are unfaithful I will scatter you among the nations but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name now there are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. We talked about this prayer previously. I just will say that he was a cupbearer of the king Artisers and whose wife was Esther the queen and the captain of the of the of the yard or the front gates was uh, Mordecai <clears throat> just like Daniel and the other three had ruled over the Babylonian Empire they were scattered but God places them as uh, head or as leaders those who revere before God's name and can rule these kingdoms. This is one of the components when a person reveres before God in prayer. This gives our faith ability to expand. Seventh component in keeping and increasing our faith in the faith of God is a total sanctification in the 50th year, the Jubilee. Leviticus 25, 9 through 13. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout throughout all their lands, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants, it shall be a ju jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee to you, in, in it you shall eat neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your intended vine, for it is the jubilee, it shall be holy to you. The jubilee, year of jubilee, is receiving the Lord as the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life. When we receive the Lord as the, the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life, then He, we, that means we are sanctified. If we are, we need to complete, perform complete sanctification, separate from our, uh, our nation, our house, and our personal desires, and receive the Holy Spirit not as a greatly honored guest, but as the Lord of our life. And then we are led by God into His inheritance, and we become righteous by faith. We have the right to all of His promises, and we return to what we lost in, in our inheritance. <clears throat> Fourth question, what results follow from collaborating the faith of man with the faith of God? <clears throat> Previously, we noted that the results of keeping our faith in the faith of God, we will be in a position to firstly subdue kingdoms, work righteousness, obtain promises, stop the mouth of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, <clears throat> out of weakness be made strong, be valiant in prayer, turn to the flight the armies of the alien, receive your dead raised to life again, experience torture, also chains and imprisonment, get stoned, being sawed in two, being tempted, being slain with the sword, wander about in sheepskins and goatskins, being distute, afflicted and tormented, wander in deserts and mountains, <clears throat> in dens and caves of the earth. <clears throat> and so the first part is generally read by the by preachers, but the second part is removed. They only talk about how they 
uh, subdue kingdoms, work righteousness, obtain promises, but they never talk about the rest of it, <coughs> that you're going to experience torture and be tested and experience prison and being destitute, being afflicted be tempted and so forth. They don't talk about those things. They're always attempting to present the, the positive things. And when a person is... Because when they say, if you have these other uh, other things in your life, then there's something wrong with you. It's the opposite. This person, there's something wrong with this person. He's experiencing these things for reasons. And so for the above findings from Scripture, the result of our walk in the faith of God is revealed in the results of our hope upon God. Rule 7 study seven results. First result of keeping our faith in the faith of God, we will be able to overcome the hostile tor towards us world. Second result of keeping our faith in the faith of God, we will be able to get to know God and his word. Third result of keeping our faith in the faith of God, we will be able to take a bold or noble risk. Fourth result of keeping our faith in the faith of God, we will be able to walk in ways or upon paths we do not know. Fifth result of keeping our faith in the faith of God, we will be able to immediately react to the voice of God. Sixth result of keeping our faith in the faith of God, we will be able to to differentiate the voice of God in the man that God has placed over us from others and follow God's voice in this man. And seventh result, in keeping our faith in the faith of God, we will be able to <coughs> bear fruits of our spirit. <coughs> and to study these given results that determine our walk in the faith of God by which we will be able to examine ourselves, it is necessary to search and examine ourselves and not our neighbor, which is something that quite often happens with people. We need to test ourselves as to whether we show obedience of our faith to the leading faith of God or do we not. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you are disqualified, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. To examine the level location of our faith in the faith of God, we need the criteria of truth, which determines the level of our collaboration of our faith with the faith of God, or the level and step of our dedication and obedience to the commanding words of God. But, before, but first, I would like to present a small commentary of one of the places of Scripture that is often received and presented as criteria determining our walk in the faith of God, but really isn't. Mark 16, 17, 18. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serp serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will it by no means will hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. The signs that are supposed to follow a believer are not a definition of their walk in the faith of God, but a definition of the expression of the power of the Holy Spirit, the, re that re the release and practice of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The things that are called to define our walk in the faith of God are called to benefit first us. They will be in the fruit. Practicing the gifts of the Holy Spirit is called to benefit those that surround us. Gifts are given for the edification of the church. And of course, we need the ability to bear fruit and the ability to practice gifts of the Holy Spirit. We need to learn well that upon the list of priorities, the ability to walk in the faith of God in faithfulness and holy truth needs to be first place, needs to take precedence over the practicing of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16:26. Very often the reason our need, we have a need for healing is an in, in inherited sin or a newly committed sin due to our ignorance or our ambitions. Then the healing that is done by practicing the gifts of the Holy Spirit can be either a counterfeit of the spirit of deception if we did not, uh, were not delivered from sin or we did not repent but were healed, then this is a counterfeit that is accompanied by spirit of deception or as a pain reliever that dulls or temporarily numbs the pain and in doing so allows the sickness of sin 
and deception to develop and progress into our lethal outcome or end. Walk in faith is the true medicine that when we are crucified with Christ is called to deliver us from the reason for the sickness, which is our old nature, leading us into, de into de deception and sin, presenting itself as the revelation of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are called to deliver us only from the results of sin, which can be various sicknesses, but the truth is called to deliver us from sin that is contained in the teaching of the blood of the cross of Christ. The truth contained in the teaching of the cross of Christ is called to deliver us from the producer of sin, being our old nature or old self. In this way, the practicing of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is good and edifying only upon the condition when the truth about the blood of Christ and the truth about the cross of Christ stands above or as head over their practice. People that upon their list of priorities have placed the measuring of their faith and the level of their spiritual growth in direct dependence of practicing of gifts, perished in the wilderness, not inheriting or reaching the promise that God had given them. Considering that our time is up, we will bend our knees, our heads, however who is comfortable, and we will thank him for that word that we were able to hear today. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we worship together with your people, and I thank you for the greatness and might of your word that you have placed above all of your name, submitting yourself to that very word and making yourself a servant of your word. You became a servant of your word. You said that everything that you said, you can fulfill it. You fulfill only what came out of your mouth and not what we want or desire, not what people want and what people say. You will fulfill only your words because you are not the slave or servant of, the, of men's word but your own words. You want your children in the same way to become servant of your word as you became a servant of your word so that this great position of being a servant of your word would become the thing of your people that they would seek the better calling in Christ Jesus which is called a servant. I thank you for your flocks that can confront deception because they know the voice that is yours the, in the voice of your delegated one and wherever your sheep may be scattered you made it so that they may determine that they may find the voice because you placed anointing in their heart by which they're able to differentiate a person sent by God from a person that people elect and from a person that has placed himself may your children be blessed before your face that have become obedient to your word and have inclined their ear and have circumcised their heart so that you would be able to give them a revelation to know you, to know in the last days where you are ready to reveal the power of your appearance to rapture bride from this earth. You are, are, are already preparing and the spiritual place, spiritual atmosphere is in action. You're cleansing your church, you're gathering the chafe or the weeds and binding them and casting them out so that they may be burned, prepared for the devil and his angels. We worship before you and we thank you for being with us and being faithful to your word. When we sin, we are yours and we accept your power. We thank you that with all of our imperfection, we are perfect in you. When we fall, you give us the opportunity to stand again, to rise again, to leave sin and to fight these sins. We may lose a lot of battles, but we will win the war because you overcame and you wanted your children to know that you have won the war and that they should not be disappointed if they lost battles in certain aspects of their life that the war will be won because you already won it on the Golgotha you 
were raised from the dead, you resurrected, and with your resurrection you destroyed strategy, stra uh, tr all kinds of sicknesses and destruction and sin. May your children be blessed who rise. They're wounded, but they rise again and again, wounded by sin, wounded by all kinds of things, including words spoken by others. Thank you that you've taught us to forgive and to bind the wounds of our neighbor, to wash the feet of our neighbor. We thank you. May your words be blessed for your nation and the word blessed in their hearts. <clears throat> May your Urim and the Thummim be blessed in the hearts of your people that have binded themselves to you. We worship before you, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen.